Wednesday. Happy Hump Day. Uh, I am so excited this evening to share again with you um, on our welcome to our care for the caregiver session for this month. I am super excited about this evening and um, particularly my guest. September is National Self-Care Awareness Month. And so with that in mind, one of the things that I wanted to do is to share with you, um, we, I wanted to talk from, the, to share this night, this night from the topic of mental and emotional wellness, because I think that that is um, a big aspect of self-care. You know, I think about in Vogue's old song, Dr. C, um, free your mind and the rest will follow. <laughs> and yes, so indeed. if we can really work on our own mental, then that will help so much. Uh, and, and we all know that this last uh, two years, um, especially, has been like one collective um, fiery furnace mm -hmm. in, in so many regards. And so with that in mind, we're going to talk about our emotional and our mental wellness tonight. And I am so excited to have uh, another one. Look, finer women are everywhere and doing everything and doing the darn thing. And yes, this is another one of my sorority <laughs> sisters. This is Dr. Sharla Lewis. I am so excited to have her with us tonight, streaming live from Texas. Uh, Dr. Lewis has is a licensed psychologist. She has been in the field for 17 years and she has is licensed in multiple states. So where wherever you are, if you need her and if you need her services, then yes, she she's got you. And most recently, she became the president. Let me get this right. She became the president of the American Dance Therapy Association. And she's well, the chapter, the Texas about, chapter. Of the, of the Texas chapter of the American Dance Therapy Association. And so she is going to talk about that a little bit tonight as well. So you don't have to be a caregiver to, to join this discussion because I'm calling this, let's get our minds right. Let's talk about emotional and mental wellness, a topic that still can tend to be um, taboo is a lot less than it was, but taboo in the black community. And now, Charlie, you know, you know me, you that I, I believe in Jesus and therapy. Like, thank I'm you. Not, yes, you know, already. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. hallelujah. Got That's the, Bible. the first word of Got the night the right there. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, so, and yes, too. yes, yes. I believe God created the the discipline of therapy. And so, you know, he can use that to help us to heal. We have been through, we go through so much on a daily basis. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's where I want to start is that, yes, Evangelist T believes in both. So, mm -hmm. you know, let's not feel like people, brothers and sisters, you, you're not spiritual. You don't believe in God. If you go to a therapist, the devil is a liar. I have been, I, I don't mind being transparent mm -hmm. and talking about myself. I have seen a therapist. And mm -hmm. so we need to be able to be comfortable in those spaces. So from the caregiving standpoint, Charla, um, doc, or Dr. C, Dr. Charla. Whatever, whatever, I, whatever. I'm Charla. I can be Charla. I can be Dr. C. <laughs> For the dance folks, I'm, I'm Char or Dr. Char. Everybody who knows me knows whatever space I'm in, I may have a different name, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> that works, okay. So first of all, Welcome, welcome, thank welcome, you. welcome. Thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. You just don't know. Um, <laughs> and even in your introduction, just thinking of a lot of what I do as a helper, as a mental health professional, and as a professional caregiver is just sharing information with people. And so the whole thing that you were saying about you don't have to be a caregiver in particular, 
when I was um, sharing the, the post about the event tonight and on my social media, I was saying to people, you know, all of us have somebody or something that we care that we care for, that we take care of, that we're passionate about, that we're invested in and we want it to do well. Yes. And so it can be, you know, an elderly or a sick relative. It can be, you know, a friend who seems to always be in the midst of some storm and you're trying to be, you know, a support, you know, for them. It could be just, you know, trying to make it through your day to day and keep your sanity and not, you know, run people over on the road or, you know, throw things at people in the store, you know, those kinds of things. That's very um, true. And so I think it's important to just have the opening of we as people of color are a little bit better about seeing to our medical health, our physical mm -hmm. health. And it's the same thing of Jesus in therapy too, Jesus in medicine too. You That's trust good. the doctor, you'll go to physicians because you believe that they are trained, they're knowledgeable. In some cases, they're anointed, they're called to be healers and do what they do. And mm -hmm. you don't question that. But if it's counseling, if it's therapy, if it's your mental and emotional health, I don't know, it's some witch doctors, it's some, I don't know, y'all got some witchcraft and some demonic stuff going. You want me to, you know, hug and, and rock myself? I don't know. But there's no confidence in that. There's no trust in that. Right. But those people have been called. Those people have been trained. Those people have been anointed too. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, even thinking of it that way of your whole body health, not just your physical body, because that's the other thing about, you know, taking care of ourselves. The whole self-care thing is people think, OK, self-care is I'm taking care of the outside. I got my nails done, got my wig split, got my clothes. I'm doing this. I'm taking care of myself. That's the exterior. Yes. Self-care is really more about how easily do you get irritated or upset about things? Mm. How resilient are you when you come across, you know, challenges or unexpected changes or disappointments? Your nails, your hair, your face can be beat. But if your spirit, if your emotions aren't together, you'll get into all kinds of things that may cause, you know, other kinds of problems. So, I mean, that's just the opening of it of like, let's start taking some of the stigma out of, you know, even the discussion of. Yes, talk to a counselor, talk to a social worker, talk to a pastoral therapist. If you if you you know are having that issue of secular or community based or whatever outside of your faith community, find a faith community that believes in and incorporates that in the ministries that they offer to the congregation. There are lots of churches that offer Christian counselors and pastoral counseling, all of that kind yes. of thing. Yes. So they give you that biblical piece, that spiritual piece, in addition to what we know about human behavior and human you know physiology anatomy that right there is a strong opening thank you thank you so much dr charlotte because it's true like your hair can be done your nails can be done but how many people have had breakdowns or or committed suicide and you know basically think they look fine on the outside but they were like shattered and broken mm -hmm on the inside and nobody knew it you know mm -hmm. it's not this is not the day and age where people are um they look disheveled and so you that's the indicator that they're mentally ill mm -hmm. and you're right we have done a better put greater priority on our physical over our mental and so sisters and brothers that right there great opening like we have got to do better Mm -hmm. with with our emotional and mental well-being mm -hmm. and that's why we're here tonight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes so like i said that is a point of information that i share quite a bit when i meet with clients when i'm doing assessments when i'm doing therapy when i'm you know having conversations with parents you know about their children or having conversations with adults about the things that have happened to them in the past Mm -hmm. And they may or may not be aware of how that continues to influence what they do and how they do it now. It's always that thing of, you know, let's take some of the fear factor out of this. Like, am yeah. I scary? Like, especially with little kids and teenagers, my whole thing is like, okay, I know you don't know what to expect. 
you're going to see a psychologist and I'm going to ask you all these questions. So if you think I'm starting to get scary or you feel like you're starting to get afraid, tell me because I do not want you to be afraid. That's good. And can I, let me just say audience, family, friends, I see I see many of you on and thank you tonight for that. Please uh, share this this um, broadcast tonight. Share it on your personal pages. I welcome you to do that. Good evening to everybody. I appreciate you joining in and I hope that this is um, going to be helpful. And as we go through this evening, if you do have questions and comments, please comment. We want, I love interaction. Um, yes. And so Charla, let's start with those who are caregivers. I know that you personally weren't, but I know you said you, um, had relationships and friendships with those who were from a, from that standpoint, what has been your observation? Um, I can speak for, of course, myself and what I went through mm -hmm. as a caregiver and the myriad of emotions. The first one, probably when I became a caregiver was fear because I'm like, Oh my God, how did this happen? Oh my God, mm -hmm. is he going to live? Oh my God. How did I get here? Like the, mm -hmm. Oh my God, <laughs> this mm -hmm. really was there. And it was very real. And, uh, and then the, how in the ham sandwich am I going to navigate through this? So fear, a little bit of panic and, you know, faith intertwined all throughout but then a bunch of other emotions as time went on mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. trying to manage the mo my emotions, the change in my mom, who, you know, I was last a caregiver for the changes in her that were physical, but then there was emotional changes there mm -hmm. because she couldn't do some of what she was used to doing. And then my own, you know, just managing emotions for both of us to some degree, as well as um, trying to manage the load of being a caregiver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess in being a helper of caregivers, like the older you get, I guess there's more of that that happens, right? So now we're all at you know the age where we're caught in between generations. Yes. So there are people who may have children and families of their own that they're taking care of. But then they may have to take care of a, a sick sibling or an elderly parent or some other relative who is important enough for them to take on that role. Um, for me, it was having a very ill sister um, who had type one diabetes and all other kinds of, you know, related problems and health conditions throughout the course of her life and watching my mom, I'll say my bonus mom, um, being the caregiver for her, even when she didn't want to be taken care of, even when she lived hundreds of miles away, even when, you know, um, they would almost maybe even get into physical, you know, tussles and altercations of like, this is what you need to do. Well, I don't want to do that. Or I'm going to do it when I want to do it. I don't want to oh, do it when yes. you want me to do it. Like being on the sidelines of that for my sister's entire life. <laughs> um, and then now having friends who have been taking care of, you know, elderly or sick parents, um, a couple of girlfriends that have buried parents that they've been primary caregivers for some that are still in, in the midst of taking care of parents that are declining, you know, mentally with, you know, um, cognitive disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's. And it's, it's really hard. One of the things that is a tremendous support for caregivers is having people like me on the sidelines, the helpers of the helpers, the friends, you know, the sisters, cousins, coworkers, those supportive people who you can plug into, that you can vent to, that you can collapse against, and you don't have to be a caregiver in the time that you're with them. Yes. Uh, can I get a witness? Every caregiver <laughs> would like to have um, even maybe 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes a, a week, because we know every day is not realistic, but where you can just take off the caregiving hat. Mm -hmm. Like, like mm -hmm. it, and it's like, and that doesn't mean I don't love my loved one, but I just, I did one, I didn't ask for this real talk. And so two, I'm doing it, but can I take off the caregiving hat? I, yeah, sin, I, I see. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to take that off. Hey, Valerie, mm -hmm. you know, like, 
Like I'm taking off these glasses. I'm right, like, I need off. a break. Whoa, whoa. And mm -hmm. too many people, when you said it, the, uh, that that's one of the greatest assets is having people in your corner that can be that sounding board, that mm -hmm. can be that help even for a few hours. Um, so you can go get your nails done. Go get a massage. Just go walk around the mall. Just go mm -hmm. walk around at a park, something. That I have found helps the mental health of caregivers a great deal. And when mm -hmm. they don't have that, it is hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's, of course, with being, you know, a, a helper, a professional helper, I also have to, you know, read and be, you know, abreast of research and, you know, changes and all of that um, in the field. And that is something that is well documented within the research of having the network having a, a have the caregiver having his or her own support network but the rub with that is is that caregivers have a tendency to be completely closed off and to have tunnel vision yeah that's part of you being all in being in love with the person that you're taking care of being passionate about them getting the care that they need having to you know maybe deal with um the independent and and fiery spirit of the individual who you are trying to care for and direct guide into getting the help that they need everything else can kind of gets closed off and left behind because you are so super hyper focused on the caregiver role and that is a prime recipe for burnout it would be mm -hmm. a, burn, a, a recipe for burnout in whatever you were doing in totality only completely focused and everything is sacrificed at the cost of that thing you'd burn out and so that's what happens a lot too of yes i have this wonderful network of people but i'm not reaching out to them that's good. i'm not texting i'm not returning texts i'm not making phone calls i'm not showing up at you know get togethers or things like that and some of that is part of the process because like you were saying having a myriad of feelings one of them is grief Yes. Yeah. Even while the person is still here. Some yeah. Oh, of that is yeah. Grief of who they used to be. Yeah. What they used to be able to do, the relationship, the dynamic that you used to have with them. Or yes. even, you know, recognizing that there may not be a return from the point from the, the road that you're going down with this person. Mm. So even while you're trying to be there and go through the appointments and the medications and, and the tug of wars. There's still that part of like something is we're in the process of separating. Something is dying. We're in the process of loss here. Um, and so that's another reason why people tend to pull away because they're grieving and they're sad and they don't want to feel like they're putting too much of a burden or talking too much about their feelings or God forbid, because, you know, people of color, we don't cry. We don't emote. We don't express. We don't let stuff out. I, it, it'll be bubbling in your chest. It'll be on the tip of your tongue. It'll be throbbing in your temples, but you won't let it out. You won't say anything. Wow. And that's part of those, like I said, those factors that add to people being, you know, burnout and getting sick themselves. You can't take care of somebody if you're sick. You can't you take can. care of somebody if you're, you know, wounded, you know, limping. So that's another I guess, piece of information that I would want to just drop into the community of people in that role of don't allow yourself to stay isolated. Mm. I got to do this. I have to do this. Nobody else understands. Nobody else would get it. Like I said, that that is untrue and unfair and impossible to sustain. The part about it being impossible to sustain is so critical for us to understand because it is, in some cases, you feel like it's, it's more trouble for me to explain to my family or to my friend how to take care of so-and-so, so I'll just do it myself and I'll just forego my own personal life. Or it's more trouble, it's more difficult for me to get their meds together and to warn them about this and to teach them about how to do this. So I'll just do it and I'll just hang back and you're, you're whittling away. 
Um, and, and then also that part about the aspect of grief as it relates to no longer, you know, the person is no longer able to do what they used to, or you see, you, you really, you start to grieve who they were, especially mm -hmm. for Alzheimer's and dementia mm -hmm. loved ones. This person d barely recognizes me and I'm giving up my, I'm dedicating now yes. a greater part of my life yes. to care for somebody who on some days doesn't even know my name. I could be a random stranger at a care facility and they would know the difference. Yeah. And, and so it hurts. painful. Yeah. And so though what you, I think that one, recognizing that, you know, is important because so many people, before I wrote the first book and from Carefree to Care, Caregiver, so many people we used to say, oh yeah, so-and-so mom lived with them or their dad, they're taking care of their dad or their you know, husband had a stroke, so they're taking care of him. But you didn't know what that entailed mm -hmm. and what that really means. That's like, oh, they just live with them. Okay, cool. But when you realize <laughs> they're living with them, I'm feeding them, and um, some cases, in some cases, bathing them. They're dependent. Some, yeah, they they're like basically a, a a seventy year old child. Yes. Um, who cannot do for themselves, and even if they don't live with you, but you know, you're they're now dependent, as you said, they're now another dependent. At mm -hmm. this stage in my own life, I now have another dependent. Mm -hmm. I'm not twenty three. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm fifty eight. And I have another dependent, you know, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is what, that, that's um, a lot to absorb. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. And, and that's just what may be happening right now. There's nothing that speaks to what you were already dealing with before you found out that this family member was sick until mm -hmm. you found out the level of support and help and, and um, surveillance that person now needs. So your life was already whatever it was with stressors and, and frustrations and all of that. And then you've got that on top of it. And then again, in experience and working with people, that's just the present. Hmm. If you got stuff that's in your closet, in your trunk, in you know your, uh, your duffel bag, your backpack that still hasn't been unpacked and dealt with, it's still there. And once you get overwhelmed or once you get stressed out or once you get sick, those things start to creep up and they're like, okay, we ready to be sad. We ready to be angry. We ready to tear some stuff up. We ready to cuss people out. Let's go. But again, it's like, oh no, wait, I feel those things coming. I feel those emotions. I feel it start. Ooh, I wish somebody would. Hell yes. Oh yes. Woo, yes. Please pull up in front of me. Please try to cut me off and see what happens. I'm about to boil over. Wow. That's that that's that powder keg and that wick waiting on that little tiny spark of something. Mm. And it's not just gonna blow up you trying to take care of somebody. It's not just gonna blow up what your current life looks like. It's gonna incinerate and start to blow up all that other stuff that's underneath. Wow. So that's something else that caregivers and, and other people who are taking care of people, sometimes it starts to creep up is your unfinished, unfinished business. Yeah. Starts yeah. to rear its head. Yeah. So then you're even more stressed out, even more emotional, even more overwhelmed, and you're not reaching out to anybody and you still have to hold everything that's going on, even though you, you frustrated or want to, you know, cuss, kick and cry. You can't with your relative, your loved one, because you got to take care of them. You have to be um, a saint, an angel. Job, mm. how much restraint does it take to do that? A lot. <laughs> a lot. I mean, from your own personal experience, even. Because, you know, everybody, you know, well, I won't say everybody. Because that's another thing, too. If you love your loved one, that's one dynamic. If you don't love your loved one and you're the one that is having to take care of them or you love them, but it's a complicated love and you still have to take care of them. That's a whole different journey. Uh, and that's the thing, too. You know, every caregiver's journey is unique. Um, just like everyone's grief journey is unique. 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, like life, it's, it's all unique. We have similarities, we have commonalities, but the journeys are unique. And for me, I was that only child. And so, you know, I used to famously say to two of my best friends that God knew what he was doing when he made me an only child because my type A personality <laughs> would not have done well had I had living siblings. My mom had, you know, pregnancies, but she lost the other children. And mm -hmm. so God, I often say God knew what he was doing when, when he cre had me be that only um, living child for Cindy, because I wouldn't have done well with siblings who just don't pull their weight. And, mm. you know, and so I, you know, now I have friends and other caregivers in my life who really are dealing and struggling with siblings and family members, not, just, you know, who are not assisting. And while mm -hmm. we know we cannot make anybody else do anything, it's just very, that adds another layer of hurt um, onto the situation. Is there mm -hmm. any any guidance that you can offer for those who are just struggling with that part of it, like just the hurt and the, 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 it adds to the load. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say the same thing that we've been saying about all of it is that's part of the burden that you're carrying. That's mm -hmm. part of what came with, you know, unforeseen and even more stressful it came with the package of being a caregiver for whoever that individual was, right? Is. Um, and so it's still trying to recognize, okay, what all is it that I'm having to deal with? That's another part of your present. True. That's going to, you know, add stress. And like you said, add more to the, to the load and to the burden, but it's like, just like you have to find some room within yourself to reach out to that one friend who is going to be that that kernel, that nugget of, you know, support for you so that you're not doing it by yourself. It's that same thing of recognizing you're not, it's not going to go the way that you would have hoped. It's not going mm. to look the way that you wanted it to look. Just like you being in this role and what, you know, you're helping your loved one contend with is not something that you saw coming. True. So even that is, you know, going through a, a process of grieving too, of like, you know, um, what's that is a, a famous uh, psychologist from like 60 years ago that had done research on the grieving process and the stages of grief of, you know, you get angry and you bargain and you get depressed. And mm -hmm. so all of those things, all of that is still part of that process of grieving what was or grieving what you would have wanted it to be or how you, you know, wished, hoped, envisioned that it would be. I wish I did have my other two siblings to help me. This would lighten the load. This would help with resources. This would help with being able to take breaks and all of that. I could be angry about what isn't, or I could look at what is, except the <laughs> jankiness of that part of the situation, and then try to find out what you can do or who you can enlist, what help you can you know, grab on to, to help fill in some of the gaps because your siblings aren't or your other family members aren't. Right. Um, and knowing that you don't have the, the room or the bandwidth to fight those battles with them right now. Mm, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Like, so yeah, basically okay. I have to move uh, on. I, I really to... am disappointed in you. I really feel betrayed. I really am angry, but that's energy that I can't get into back and forth with you about because I need to save for the person that I'm taking care of and some for me. I'm not going to give you the last little bit for you to just frustrate me and, ang and anger me and, and, and make me even more, you know, whatever. I'll say that piece for me. I'm going to say that, that right me. there is good. You know, Charlotte, like, release it say it you you're we're not responsible for how they respond and then save some for you that right there is like a golden nugget right like i can't give you all of me because i gotta save some 
one for the person I'm caring for, and then I got to save some for myself. Oh my God. Yes. Ooh, yes. But again, that right there was gold. That 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 is stuff that you'll be you know revisiting and saying again to your community of like, listen. Yes. You may want, like I said, I wish somebody would. Like, I got time today. That whole thing of like, you know what? I've been wanting to get on you for 10 years. And you know what? Today, I got it for you. I got it for you today. That's the energy <laughs> that you need for yourself yeah. in managing, in regulating, in, in stabilizing so that you can take good care of your person. And take good care of yourself so that you can take good care of your person. Okay. And let leave them to God. He'll handle that. He will. That, that, that's the part of like, do what you can and the rest, leave it. I recognize I cannot change your mind. I cannot make you be responsible. I cannot make you do the right thing. I can be frustrated and, blo and boil my blood about it. Or I can be like, you know what? Yes, you crazy. And I can't carry this too. Yeah. So you have to be selective. You have to prioritize what's important. What's important is taking care of this person and being as present and as healthy as I can for my life and this person's life who is dependent upon me. All these other folks that are just pulling time and energy, they cut off or they put aside until there's more bandwidth. Ooh, that That is just golden. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thing. Are probably they're very it's easy to say them honey it's easy to say them but I, like i said that's why i tell people jesus in therapy too because some of the stuff that your therapist will ask you to do is some of the things that come up that need to be handled you're gonna need some supernatural yeah yeah we are so okay so we we, we talked about the responses of other people or, or dealing with the letdowns of other people we talked a bit about grief um, and the grief of the person no longer being who they once were. Let's, let's touch on the isolation and the loneliness. Mm. And that's not even just for caregivers, but over this last year and a half, a year and now almost two years, you know, with the various restrictions and, and even still people, I'm venturing out a little bit more mm -hmm. but i still don't do nearly as much in person as i once was and i can admit that last year this time you know living alone i was like wow i felt a little lonely mm -hmm. um and i then i have friends who lived with their families and they still felt lonely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. loneliness in a covid situation oh wow so you're talking about just general people, humans in general. Yeah, you know, loneliness is in the COVID world. In, 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 yes, yes. Um, who is that? My little, um, one of my little goddaughters. She said everything is um, BC before COVID. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, girl, you better stop that. But um, for me, the way that we talk about things, the way that we word things is extremely important. You have to be very wise, very mm -hmm. judicious with how you talk to yourself, how you um, frame things, like how you put things in perspective. Okay. Um, because even when you're talking about um, isolation or just changes in, in how life is, then you're in this state of being unsettled. You know, you're out of sorts because this isn't my normal, this isn't my routine and I'm off balance. And even kind of thinking again, what we were saying about the stigma of mental health and, you know, people being pushed to their limits, like people, many people were making it, getting by, surviving before COVID. True. After everything came to a screeching halt and life as we know has changed. And it's, it's I, I don't think it's ever going to look the same as it did yeah. before. It's always going to be something other. It, 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 we have a new normal. It's, it's never going to look mm -hmm. the way that it did. Never going to work the way that it did. And so everyone has had to figure out some way to adjust, some way to adapt, some way to still get, 
you know, your needs met and still solve your problems and still manage with your stressors in possibly new ways because you can't use the same old stuff anymore or you have to be creative about how you were doing the stuff you used to do. Like I'm a very extroverted person by nature, but I have to say that during, I'll say the first six months of COVID, I was grateful for things slowing down and being quiet. Cause I felt like it gave me a chance to rest. It gave me an excuse to not have to keep running and pushing and doing stuff all the time. And then we had this whole thing at work of, we started seeing people virtually, you know, over the computers and all of that. And we had this little blurb that we had to put in all the notes of, oh, we're seeing them virtually due to social distancing. I don't like that. Again, the choices of the words you use, we didn't have to be socially distanced. We were just physically distanced. Correct. So for me, I would make that change and say to people, even in, you know, the notes and when I'm talking to people, I don't do social distancing because I have more of a social, you know, connection with some people and in some ways than I did before because I don't have to make as much of an effort to get to people. Now I can talk to you on my phone. I can talk to you on the computer. Right. I don't have to travel. I don't have to, you know, pack. I don't have to do all those things. And when I'm tired of talking, I'll be like, all right, well, it was so good to see you. And I'm so glad to hear things are going well and we'll catch each other next time. All right. All right. And click. We're done. Um, but I think there's something to be said for people having to really look at their relationships with themselves, really look at their relationships with other people because there weren't as many outside distractions and things Correct. that you know caught us up anymore. And so, like I was saying before, of when there's time and space, that unfinished business. It, it comes creeps in. back up. That that mm -hmm. that's a good point. That is wow. Yeah, the unfinished mm -hmm. business. This is this last year has given us an opportunity to go back and deal with some of our unfinished stuff. Mm -hmm. And so whether, whether we were ready to or not. <laughs> yeah. Whether we were ready to or not, and 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 whether we really took advantage of it or not, we've had we can at least, we know collectively that we have had the opportunity mm -hmm. to do so. Um yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and like with anything, anybody who has had a major life change or had a major loss, um, a major milestone. You reevaluate. You look at things and you say, you know what? Is that still valuable to me? Is that as valuable to me as valuable to me as it once was? Oh my heavens! And that is so true. From both from a caregiver standpoint and just then a just a general life standpoint, I have personally found one as a caregiver. That made me reevaluate a whole lot of things because I and I had to say to myself, my primary concern at this point is my mom. That has to be my primary, you know, my primary. Um, yeah, just my primary. It's my mm -hmm. mother. The uh, certain other things I let. There were certain things and people that I let go of. There mm -hmm. were people who did not understand mm -hmm. my reprioritizing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. of my life and that also brought some time at some points um pain and hurt but i had to be able to deal with that and move on quickly because of my of my priority it go it, it went back to the priority yes now looking at this pandemic um re reevaluating priorities also mm -hmm. came into play yes for real and it, it, I, I'm going to put in a plug for a project that I've got that we'll be announcing um, this weekend, but I had to pivot. I really reevaluating re priorities causes you to pivot once you decide what's important, what's not, what can I push to the side, what can I just ch chuck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I can focus and move on. Mm -hmm. And so to, to my brothers and sisters, who are watching, whether you're a caregiver or not, I say to you, um, don't feel bad about adjusting your priorities. Because sometimes when we adjust our priorities, 
we are still caught up in and i'm looking straight at the camera because yes i'm looking at you, you know, <laughs> like when we adjust our priorities at times when god starts to shift us and we will start to feel in our spirit that we need to shift some things we can feel bad we mm -hmm. can um kind of be like yeah i i don't know if i should let this go because how are they going to feel about me? What are they going to think about me? Listen, at this juncture in this world, it is time out for being concerned about what people think, especially when your goal and you're endeavoring to one, take better care of you and two, but take better care of whomever you are caring for if you are a caregiver. And three, when you're trying to please God. Like, mm -hmm. That's just what we what you have to do. There are some points in our lives, and I had to learn this, and I'm, I'm going to be honest and transparent. That was a difficult pill for me to swallow and a difficult lesson mm -hmm. for Terrelene mm -hmm. to learn because I am mm -hmm. very much a creature of habit. Not that mm -hmm. I needed to people please, but because I'm such a creature of habit that I just wanted it to be like it was 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. God was like, uh-uh. <laughs> so gross, girl. Yeah, I'm we should have elevated you. Home. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's really true that everybody and everything can't go with us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's grief through that, too. Like, they're still alive, but they can't come with me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like like you said, re readjusting expectations, um, readjusting your priorities, reevaluating what your values are. And like you said, and who gets to come with you? Yeah. Um, the, pe the, the people in the theater, how close they're sitting, <laughs> who's still invited to the show. All of those things change yeah. when you get a major, um, I guess, like I said, a, a major event or just like a shaking. That's the only thing. That's the only way I can really think of it is a shaking of, OK, so you're caught up in all of this stuff. That's not even real. That's that's not life and death. This is life and death. Yeah. And this is when you need to decide what's going to contribute to you living better and what's going to contribute to you not living better. And whatever those things are, be like, oh, well, before, you know, yes, you know, I should stay another couple of hours at work. You know, I really got some things I need to get done. That work is going to be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If something were to happen to you, that work is still going to be there tomorrow. And who is going to look after your loved one? It's not a priority. That's true. It's not a priority. That's great. And you so, know, it's like I mean, that that saying that everybody, they can come to your show, but everybody can't be on the front row. No, like, no. Everybody does not get a front row seat in your life because some of them will drain your mental health. Drain and you some people that you have been keeping afloat and carrying in your life, just, you know, on your own. At some point, like I said, you don't have enough room or everything else that you're carrying is too heavy. And so you start to economize. You yeah. have to go. So they may not even be in, in the theater. They might be escorted out because they can't stay. Yeah. They cost too much rah-rah. They got to go. <laughs> um, something else that came to mind while, you know, you were talking about kind of making, changing priorities. Mm -hmm. um, one of the priorities is taking better care of your own health. And I know that that is something that a lot of people um, struggle with even before, again, taking on a caretaker, caregiver role. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes even more difficult to manage now that they've, you know, poured everything into this one um, person and, and this one kind of like focus. Um, and again, it is thinking to myself, okay, if I, if I'm the locomotive here, I am what drives the train. If I break down, nothing moves. Mm nothing moves. So I have to be mindful at some point. And like I said, it's, it's always thinking things in, I guess I'll call it like a, a, a micro step, not even a baby step. It's a micro step of, you know what? Today I'm going to drink two glasses of water. That may be the only thing that you do that is more health promoting than your typical, but it's still more health promoting than your typical. Mm-hmm. My new thing now is I have like a three pound hand weight that I leave in my desk drawer at work. And when I start to get stressed and really want to go buy something from the vending machine, 
I'll sit and start to do, you know, curls or whatever with the, the three pound and then switch what it may not make, you know, the things that are flapping and waving under my arms tighter overnight, but it's a good use of energy. Yeah. It's a good boost of chemicals. It's a way to take care of myself in a micro step than nothing at all. Okay. Love that. Love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's real. And that's because, like I said, of not being a, a caregiver of a loved one as of yet, because I know that that will come. But in being a professional caregiver of I take care of people every day, all the time, I'm hearing, you know, the best and worst of people's lives all the time. And in order for me to do that and not break down and burn out, I have to be mindful of those little micro steps also, because I'm no good to them. If I come to the session and I'm crying and wanting to tell you about what's going on with me, that defeats the whole purpose. You came for the help. You're not, you know, wanting to be there for, to, to help me. Like that's not how that's right, supposed to work. Right. So as the caregiver, you have to find ways, little, unusual, unconventional at weird times of day that you can incorporate to keep yourself as you know balanced and, and healthy as you possibly can that's good stuff that's real talk and so that's a perfect segue into this new thing that you talked about you're you're involved in that goes back to balance and to movement and wellness um what it, you said is called the i want to say it correctly Dance therapy, dance movement dance therapy? movement therapy, yes. Dance movement therapy. Tell yes. us about that. Oh my gosh. See, okay. First of all, I love, love, love being a mental health person. I'm not always happy about working, but I love being able to have that information and share it with people. Mm -hmm. The new part of, you know, my passion and I will say my calling in life is I've always been a dancer, like okay. from before I could walk dance classes, all different types, all that stuff. So that's always been something that was a passion and an outlet for me. And then being, you know, a counselor therapist. So years had gone by and I started to really burn out, overweight, unhealthy, frustrated, overworked, all of these things and was talking to one of my dance mentors. And she was like, well, why don't you just like look into dance therapy? I mean, like you do both of those things all the time. Why don't you just put it together? And I was like, what you mean put it together? She's like, yeah, there's a there's a whole thing like it. Dance therapy is a thing. Look it up. Looked it up. Wow. My mind has been blown since 2013 when I first, you know, found out that there was such a thing as dance movement therapy. But basically it is one of the expressive arts um, therapy modalities. So that's play therapy, art, music, dance. Um, I'm missing somebody. Drama. Okay. All of those expressive creative arts are infused in traditional psychotherapy practices and give more options for people to um, use them as ways to unpack, manage, understand, release um, emotions, trauma, grief, all of those things. So I'm excited because I'm like, wait a minute. I don't have to just be sitting down all the time or writing reports or talking. We can move, we can share, we can mirror, we can express things that may not even have words. Wow. Like when you talk about really deep feelings, negative emotions, a lot of why, like I joke about, we don't cry, we don't emote. A lot of the reason why people do that is because they're afraid if I take the lid off of it, if I take the scab off of this mm. wound, I'm not going to be able to stop the bleeding. I'm not going to be able to stop anything that happens. I'm going to be out of control and nobody wants to feel out of control. So we just hold on to those things. That's true. What dance movement therapy does, what expressive arts therapies do is it uses different ways to get to some of those experiences and those memories and those thoughts and emotions that don't necessarily have to do with words and language. And not only does it give you another way to communicate, it also makes changes in your brain to where when we have trauma, when we have negative experiences and negative emotions, it shuts certain things off. It closes oh. certain pathways down. 
it breaks certain memories apart. So you may not have all parts of the same memory. It may be in shards and pieces all over your memory and in your body because it's just too much to, to manage all in one piece. Dance movement therapy and the other expressive arts find other ways in through other pathways and other parts of your brain to get past those blockages, to create wow. new neural pathways in your brain, and sometimes to even heal and repair those areas that have been shut down and cut off. Wow. Right. So, you think it's just dancing, right? No. I, I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to assume, but yes, I did. Yes. It's like, okay, we're gonna put some music on and we're gonna dance and we're gonna feel better. That is use of dance as a therapeutic outlet, but that is not dance therapy. Wow. Dance therapy, dance movement therapy is using movement is using nonverbal communication, is using ways to um, connect with an individual who is based and calm and self-regulated to help that other person get into that same kind of space, get into that same kind of mindset, and hopefully start to change the way that their brains work by moving their bodies. So how can someone get involved in dance movement therapy? Um, I would like, say is it virtual thing. or is it in person? Um, would someone need to find a chapter like in the DMV if they're in, the, in this area or wherever they are? Um, good questions. So the first thing I would say is just the awareness of it is one thing of um, creative arts therapies are used with some of the individuals that we're talking about, the populations that caregivers take care of, of you know, children with developmental disabilities, mm. of people with chronic illnesses, of individuals with cognitive deficits and declines. Because again, we're using different parts of the brain and we're not relying on language. Okay. So you can access and do some other things and help to um, promote the wellness of an individual who may have some, you know, compromises through some of those, you know, non-traditional, unusual artistic ways of, you know, kind of accessing that. To be able to get in touch with or work with somebody who is in dance movement therapy, you can go to, um, we have a chapter website, the uh, Texas chapter of the American Dance Therapy Association has a chapter website. You can find out events, things that we're doing, ask inquiries about other dance movement therapists. There's several of us, I won't say several, there are many of us scattered throughout the state. Um, you can look for um, listings for people that are working in expressive arts in on psychology today. A lot okay. of therapists, um, practitioners today. advertise there. Um, what else? What else? What else? Um, and you can also ask your insurance company. Like if you're um, already working with a counselor or a therapist, you can ask them, hey, do you have any um, professional counselors in network that also have some kind of expressive arts you know, therapy background? Because okay. in order to be a working expressive arts therapist, they also have to have at least a master's level um, mental health credential in whatever state they're practicing in. Okay. Good so deal. They, they have the, the mental health stuff, but then they also have the dance movement, kinesiology, theory, all of those things um, that they put in that same bag of uh, tools and tricks that they have. That I mean, it just sounds so great for... Um, just overall uh, or multifaceted self-care. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds and one so of those, great. One of those outlets, like we were talking about those micro steps, a micro step related to expressive arts therapy might be you decide you're going to collage while, you know, um, your loved one is at an appointment or taking a nap. Um, you put on some instrumental music and move how you feel, whatever that looks like. If that if that makes you angry, move out angry. If it makes you sad, move out sad. If it makes if it brings up teariness, release the tears. Those are times and spaces where you can release and, and let some of those things go when you might not have, you know, that friend or that network or that resource. Okay. Those are ways, um, like I said, with moving or with art making. Um, with, you know, creating something, helping someone, teaching someone how to do something. Those are other, you know, like kind of micro steps in wellness. Okay. 
This is so interesting. Yes. And I'm seeing the comments. And so, yes, thank you. Oh, and so how, um, what do you do in terms of services? Are there services that you provide um, as a therapist? I know we talked before we went live about some things that you also have on the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, yes, in the, in, the ma in the making, in the works. Um, so with um, this new role with um, the ADTA, I am making more of an intentional effort to do clinical work that is um, incorporating uh, expressive arts um, techniques. So with the job that I have, it is all psychological assessment. So I have a page on psychology today under my own name um, where I kind of give a, a spiel about what I do um, and um, the different populations and issues that I feel comfortable working with. Mm -hmm. If people are interested in psychological assessment, which I'm a fan of, because I feel like if even for people who feel comfortable with accessing mental health providers, they may go the medication route. And I love my partners in mental health, psychiatrists, woo, medical school, I'm happy. But they miss some things in the way that they assess. And so I always encourage people, if you can get a psychological assessment to see what your mental health diagnoses are and how those things really play out. I'm an advocate of that. I encourage people to do that. So that is what I do with my full-time job. So that we're not my, overly medicating. Right. That, that is one of my personal. Medicating. That is one of my personal um, purposes in doing that is if medication is indicated, let's medicate you for the right thing. That's good. So and caregivers, that, that's, that's something that's, to look out with look out for your loved ones too. Because mm -hmm. I, I have had experience where um, depression medication is, is prescribed even for your loved one. And it's like, is that really needed? Mm -hmm. And so that's why, um, like I said, that is the professional, that's all I'm doing professionally right now. Okay. Outside of that, um, I'm restarting my private practice. Um, I had done it years before, but I was seeing primarily individuals. What I am moving into now is doing more therapeutic groups or what I will call psychoeducational groups that are very much like this of okay. we have a topic that I'm presenting information, sharing research, sharing um, the, um, I guess, most advantageous, most successful, effective treatments for the different kinds of difficulties and giving, you know, real life, everyday um, tips and tools of, you know, how to manage and how to get through. Okay. Um, so I see that there was a question about the website for uh, assessment. So the company that I work for is called King Haven Counseling Group. Um, their locations in um, the Houston area and also now here in Dallas. That's why um, I'm part of their, I guess, kind of branching out and building here in Dallas. Okay. Um, and so there's that. And then for access to my profile and to inquire about um, psychoeducational groups. I have um, a page on psychology today. And like I said, you can just look me up, Charla Lewis, and I'm there. So and Charla has, Lewis um, on psychology today. Psychology today. Today. Psychology mm -hmm. today com. Psychology today dot com. And then King Haven Consulting Group. King Haven Counseling Group. King, King Haven Counseling Group. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, you know, the thing. So I'm very excited about um, being able to talk more about mental health in communities of color. I'm very excited to talk about different ways of accessing wellness and therapeutic progress and all of that. And I'm a little bit excited about the fact that the pandemic has pushed so many people past, you know, their survival mode. And now they're looking for help and, and strategies to live better. You're so, welcome, yeah. Valerie. Yes, 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 yes. And I wanted to like kind of address some of the comments. There's been some awesome support of one another in, in the chat. Like, that's amazing. Yes, yes. I, my, I, I knew that this was going to be a, a well-received um, topic because, again, 
we deal with so many emotions and we didn't even get to, you know, we, and we don't have to get to all of them. I love organic conversation and I love the conversation in the chat as well. Um, so we have, we're, we're over an hour. I try to be like 45 Ooh. to 60 minutes, but the time went very quickly. It really did. <laughs> so I'm going to say is I don't because my fingers are not typing as quickly tonight. Um, but psychology today, because I don't want to spell psychology today wrong. <laughs> oh, listen, I, hey, you you are moderating and doing all kinds of stuff. Is there somewhere I can enter something somewhere? I'd be glad to help. I'm good. I'm, I think I'm good. Psych so psychology. Look, do this. Spell psychology because it's not. A he, it's, psych. it's psych. It's psych. P.S.Y.C.H. Oh, psych. yeah. Psychology. Let me today. spell it out phonetically, right? Mm -hmm. Psych. <laughs> Psychology today. Dot com, and then yes. look up Charla Lewis. Yes, and I'm sure there might be a backslash Charla Lewis or whatever. I'm not sure about how to do that. I just know if you search for me, my face pops up, and I'm like, "Hey, need some help? I can help you." Yes. So yes, I just wanted that to be on the screen so when people look at videos and things like that, they can have that as a reference. Yes. Um. Yes. So. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've gotten some awesome nuggets tonight myself. Um, so yeah. you know, I, and I always every every month I'm getting some new, just some great information. So I know that those who are watching live and those who will watch also will um, just grab take what what you can, people. Take what you can. Um, grab something for you. I mean, there were so many takeaways tonight. If you break down, nothing will move. Whoa, that was a great aha. You know, that was like an Oprah aha thing. Right there, <laughs> oh, see, listen, stuff you know for sure. Okay. You're welcome, Cynthia. <laughs> oh, in psychology today, there's another O in there. Child. I think it's missing. Okay, so you got psycho and then there's O L O. That's all. Oh. I'm missing another o. I knew it. I knew it. That's all right. Like I said, you, you um, what we call that, uh, flossum. Your flossum. It's okay. <laughs> oh yes, I see it. We got it now. So yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for everybody Dr. coming in, and hopefully you got something that is helpful, useful. I comforting. believe. I yes, yes, comforting. Be encouraged, my brothers, my sisters. This uh, we know we're living in in some trying times. We recognize that, but we also recognize that again, Jesus and therapy. And so we've had the therapy. Let me end with a little Jesus and say, you know, because God is the greatest power, we shall not be defeated. We know that He is a present help in the yeah. time of trouble. I mean, present. So whatever your situation is, brothers, sisters, you know, God is present with you and go with that that's my thing for this week i said it sunday when i had to share a message and i mm -hmm. said I, I i said you know i'm gonna go with the promises of god i'm gonna go what god told me um mm -hmm. because his word will not fail he cannot lie so go with that go with whatever promise you have sister brother caregiver whatever promises god has made to you whatever your favorite promise scriptures are i implore you tonight to go with that oh my god i feel something right there listen listen you got to start up a whole nother conversation <laughs> But I'm telling you, because there are so many opposing voices whispering in our ear, whispering yeah. in our spirit that are trying yeah. to discourage the people of God, trying to have us stay and get stuck in depression and stuck in all kinds of emotions. And mm -hmm. so, yes, go see your therapist and then grab a hold to the promises of God and then there comes a point where you got to tell the devil I'm going to go with what God said and part of going with what God said and getting out of your feet out of this the stagnant place and the place where you're stuck maybe making an appointment with a therapist yes. maybe showing up to an online appointment or whatever it is yes. but that you take it's you know the old people used to say you take one step he will take two brothers, sisters, mm -hmm. do what you got to do so that we can also maintain our mental and emotional 
wellness. And yes. with that, I'm amen, gonna let amen, go. and amen. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna say <laughs> good night, good night, good night, and again. Thank you, Dr. C. And we yes, thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone here. And God bless every household touch tonight. Yes. Amen. <laughs>